Janus, the god from whom the month of Januarius acquired its name, was the Roman deity of doorways, gates, passageways, time, and duality. Appropriately depicted with two faces gazing in opposite directions, Janus resided in the Forum within a temple barely large enough to house his bronze image, which stood a mere five cubits in height. Allegedly built in the time of Rome's second king, Numa Pompilius, who ruled from 715 to 673 BC, Janus presided over the beginnings and endings of martial conflicts observed by the opening and closing of his temple doors. The doors to the temple of Janus were first closed during the reign of King Numa Pompilius, who brought peace to the growing city of Rome by instilling in its early citizens a reverence for the gods. Unfortunately, this peace lasted only until Pompilius's successor, King Tullius Hostilius, declared war against neighboring Alba Longa, and Janus once again bore witness to the opening of his temple doors. For the next four hundred years, the doors to Janus' temple remained ajar as Rome engaged in one war after another in its conquest of Italy and surrounding areas. It would be 241 BC before they closed again by the hand of Aulus Manlius Torquatus at the conclusion of Rome's first Punic War against Carthage. Approximately fifteen years later, when the city of Rome was invaded and occupied by Gauls, arousing Rome's vengeance against the Gallic peoples, the doors were forced open for the third time as Rome sought to establish her supremacy beyond Gaul and across the Mediterranean Sea. And so it was that sometime between Sextilis XIII and XV of the 29 BC year, the Imperator Gaius Julius Caesar D.V. Filius, having defeated Marcus Antonius and Cleopatra in Egypt, returned victorious to Rome, and for the third time in Rome's seven-century history, was able to shut the doors of the duality God's temple. Finally, Rome's civil wars, which had raged for twenty long years after Julius Caesar had crossed the Rubicon River in 49 BC, were at an end. And even though military conflict persisted within isolated areas on the frontiers which bordered the Roman Empire, the Eternal City was now at peace. The closing of the doors to the Temple of Janus was part and parcel of a citywide celebration which began on Sextilis 13 of 29 BC, at which time Caesar D.V. Filius entered the city of Rome in full triumph for his victories in Illyricum and Dalmatia from 35 to 33 BC. On Sextilis 14, Caesar entered the city yet again in triumph for his victory over the forces of Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium which took place on September the 2nd of the 31 BC year. And then, in honor of his victory over Cleopatra, his conquest of Alexandria and the annexation of Egypt, Caesar entered the city in triumph for the third time on the 15th of Sextilis. Although we are not given many details regarding the triple triumph of Caesar D.V. Filius, we are given to understand that his third triumph in particular outdid anything Romans had ever seen and so we are left to assume that Caesar's triumphs followed tradition, but with colossal grandiosity. There would have been plenty of feasting and games for the enjoyment of the city's inhabitants, the wealth of Egypt and booty taken from enemies on full display, prisoners marched in chains for the crowds to belittle, and the triumphator, Caesar D.V. Filius, wearing the usual gold-embroidered purple toga picta, with face painted red. And yet, we are also told some curious details. As a substitute for the actual presence of Egypt's Queen Cleopatra, whom Caesar claimed committed suicide in Egypt so as to deprive him of the opportunity of marching her through the streets of Rome and of sacrificing her to Rome's father god, Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Caesar display a golden effigy of the Egyptian queen on a large float. Accompanying Cleopatra's effigy were her children by Marcus Antonius, coldly paraded before all of Rome in chains of gold. The eleven-year-old twins, Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene, in mockery of their names, were costumed as the sun and the moon, and the six-year-old Ptolemy Philadelphus was so weighted down in golden chains that the young boy was unable to walk. The sight of Ptolemy Philadelphus sitting in the street, unable to move, and likely crying beneath the image of his mother, 
elicited a great deal of sympathy from the crowds who booed Caesar's treatment of Cleopatra's young children. To add to the spectacle, we are told that Caesar had effected a few minor changes to the traditional trappings of a Roman triumph. In the past, the triumphator rode in a four-horse chariot known as the Quadriga, preceded in the triumphal procession by Rome's senators and city magistrates, and followed by his legions. This processional order not only emphasized the Senate's governmental authority to declare war against an enemy and to choose the general who would lead Rome's armies to victory, it also served to introduce that chosen general to the people as the servant of the state. But Caesar did not display himself in the traditional quadriga. Instead, the son of the divine Julius Caesar chose to ride ahead of the Roman Senate on horseback, positioning himself ahead of not only his legionaries, but also ahead of senators and city magistrates, not so subtly insinuating perhaps that it was through Caesar's authority that each operated. We do not know exactly how the Senate truly felt about trailing behind Caesar in his triumphal parade, but we do know that Rome's august fathers decreed that the doorposts of Caesar's home on Palatine Hill be adorned with bay leaves. The Senate also placed a golden shield within the new Curia Julia, whose nearly completed construction had been begun by Julius Caesar. The shield was inscribed by the public, thanking Caesar Divi Filius for his courage, his clemency, his justice, and his piety. On January 1st of the 28th BC year, Caesar D.V. Filius began his sixth term as Roman consul. Under direct threat from his legions, the Senate had elected Caesar, who was then Octavianus, to his first consulship in 43 BC, following the suspicious deaths of the consuls Hirtius and Panza in the aftermath of the battles of Forum Gallorum and Mutina. He had then resigned the consulship after only a few days in the office, but not before passing the Lexpedia, naming the assassination of a Roman magistrate a capital crime. He served his second consulship in 33 BC, at which time he spoke against the donations of Alexandria and began covertly agitating for war against Cleopatra. Caesar held his third consulship in 31 BC, alongside his fellow triumvir and brother-in-law, Marcus Antonius, with whom he was now at war. He maintained his consular title throughout the 30 BC year, sharing this fourth term with Marcus Licinius Crassus, the grandson of the Crassus who had died at the Battle of Cari. In 29 BC, Caesar was consul for the fifth time and shared the Fasces with his nephew, Sextus Apulius, who was the son of his half-sister, Octavia the Elder. Caesar's consulships Though acquired by either the power of the sword or through triumviral appointment, even while in absentia, were held illegally for the most part, considering the sullen laws requiring a ten-year waiting period before seeking re-election, had nevertheless not been repealed. Caesar D.V. Filius have used his extraordinary military and triumviral powers to monopolize the office of consul. However, in conjunction with his sixth consulship, which he shared with Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, Caesar vowed to the Senate that his 28 BC consulship would be according to the law. And so began the negotiations within the Senate, where many harbored the hope that Rome might no longer require the continuance of unchecked offices with extraordinary powers in order to maintain some semblance of peace. But following the death of Marcus Antonius, Caesar D.V. Filius now held command of all of Rome's legions, along with the adoration of the Roman people who were overjoyed to see an end of civil wars, and with them the end of lost husbands, fathers, brothers and sons. This public outcry led the supporters of Caesar to make an attempt to offer him the dictatorship, as his adoptive father had held, charging him with leading the empire back to prosperity. Yet, those hoping not to revisit the past must have been relieved when Caesar, in keeping with his newly vowed republican sentiments, refused. Throughout the 28 BC year, a back and forth took place between the supporters of Caesar, who did not wish to see him step down from power, and the Senate, which now saw within its grasp a once-held but long-lost supremacy. Finally, on January 13 of the 27 BC year, in his seventh term as consul, a number equal to the consular terms of Rome's third founder, Gaius Marius, 
Caesar called a meeting of the Senate. There, at what is known as the first constitutional settlement, Caesar Divi Filius declared before the conscript fathers his intention to retire from politics completely, and as the dictators Lucius Quinctius Cincinnatus and Lucius Cornelius Sulla had done, lay down his tyrannical powers and return to private life. Aghast at this announcement, his supporters within the Senate implored Caesar to remain in office, likely arguing that his absence would create a void which too many ambitious senators would be only too happy to fill, setting the stage for the conditions which might allow civil war to begin anew. Although it is said to have taken some convincing, Caesar D.V. Filius reluctantly acquiesced, agreeing to share the burden of governing with the Roman Senate and to maintain control over those provinces where military strife continued while giving back to the Senate those provinces where peace prevailed. As a result of the first constitutional settlement, Caesar was granted a ten-year supreme command over the provinces of Egypt, Syria, Cyprus, Cilicia, Illyricum, Gaul and Hispania, with the right to appoint his own legates under his sole authority to govern each province. The Senate would have no say within Caesar's provinces, but would maintain the senatorial governance of Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, Africa, Cyrene, Crete, Anatolia, Bithynia et Pontus, Achaea, and Macedonia as provinces in which Caesar Divi Filius would wield no power. Despite the fact that the division of provinces between Caesar Divi Filius and the Senates saw Caesar in control of the provinces which held the majority of Rome's legions, an accord was finally reached. In recognition of his role in forging peace between the military and the Senate, the Coroma Civica, or Civic Crown, was permanently fixed above Caesar's door. Acknowledged as the second highest military crown behind the Corona Graminae, or Grass Crown, the Civic Crown was uniquely awarded as a military honor earned by saving one's fellow Roman citizens from being slain by the enemy, as attested to by those who were saved. As awarded to Caesar Divi Filius by the Senate and people of Rome, the civic crown came to symbolize the lives saved by Caesar's agreement to jointly govern the empire, thus engendering a peace which might prevent the possibility of yet another civil war. Receiving such an accolade served to further align Caesar Divi Filius with the altruistic attributes of his divine adoptive father, Julius Caesar, who was awarded the civic crown at the age of 19 by the Roman citizens of Mytilene. In addition to ordering the civic crown affixed to his door, a motion was made to honor Caesar Divi Filius with a new cognomen. They wished to call him Caesar Romulus in honor of Rome's founding father and first king. Although we are told that Caesar Divi Filius very much liked the idea of being called Romulus, it is likely that his supporters persuaded him that assuming such a name was dangerous. For a man who made a public display of returning power to the people, only to walk away from that same meeting with more power than any other man had ever legally claimed, it may have been unwise to adopt a name which carried kingly implications. And while the mythological story surrounding the death and apotheosis of Romulus was replete with romantic tales of those who witnessed his divine spirit ascending into the heavens, another, much darker tale also surrounded the death of Romulus, said to have been murdered by his senate under the cover of either a dense fog or solar eclipse, his body chopped up and carried out piecemeal, hidden within the togas of those who had murdered him. And so, on January 16th of the 27 BC year, just three days after the constitutional settlement, another honorific was proposed for Caesar Divi Filius. Lucius Minatius Plancus, the man who had been a witness to the last will and testament of Marcus Antonius before encouraging Caesar to steal the document from the House of the Vestals and reveal its contents to the Senate, motioned that Caesar Divi Filius be given a name which combined his military authority his piety as both a pontifex and augur, and his personal dignitas and octoritas, which were unmatched in Roman history. Plancus motioned he be called the revered. Caesar Divi Filius accepted this new honorific, which bore no kingly implications, and was forever after known as Caesar Augustus.